Hey guys, so today we're going to be taking a look at Fedora 25, but just before I get into the first impressions review itself, I just want to keep you guys up to date on the social media side of things related to this channel. So of course you can follow me on Twitter, but I also do the occasional live stream over on Twitch as well as this channel. Uh, there is also a subreddit associated with this channel and a lot of the recordings for sort of secondary stuff that doesn't make it onto this channel as well as uh, the live stream recordings themselves can be found on uh, my second channel and I'll put links to all of those down in the description below for those of you that want to follow some of the expanded stuff in relation to this channel. Okay so on to Fedora 25. Now uh, I'm gonna just do a quick uh, synopsis at the beginning here because there isn't really that much to say about Fedora in general. It makes six monthly um, releases that seem to be really quite consistent in their approach to their operating system. The big difference between this um, distribution and Fedora 24 is that this now I believe uses Wayland as its default um, display manager. Now that is great and I think it's the first sort of major distribution to do that so a round of applause to Fedora for for finally after years now it seems breaking through and having Wayland as its default um, way of, 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 of making all the graphic-y things work nice. Uh, now it does say that to expect maybe the occasional error this is although it's supposed to be you know ready for for Fedora level production they do say that you might stumble into a few errors and, and there is an installation of X that you can um, default back to which is a bit more stable and a bit more secure. Now as usual with these distributions I run them inside of a virtual machine and I've had no problems really running it on terms of the hardware side of things but then again this is a virtualization so I can't speak for how reliable and how stable this will be on a bare metal installation all I can say is that as uh, as a distribution running through a virtual machine I've had no problems with Wayland and I, I've actually had no problems with the distribution at all I've had zero bugs but to be honest that is quite common because a lot of distributions now test against virtual machines um, so because it's a, it's a, it's a good sort of standard way to to test um, to test stuff uh, but that being said of course there is no uh, substitute for um, for testing stuff in the field anyway without further ado let's crack on and uh, see what this distribution is all about. Now this comes with uh, other desktop environments but I've decided to go with what I, I've always sensed as their flagship um, desktop environment which is GNOME and it's a pretty standard installation of GNOME albeit a polished one. So uh, as you can see here I've changed out the desktop background I know a lot of you guys don't consider that to be particularly important but I always like to see what backgrounds are included with the distribution um, simply because it's a, a, for me it's a good measure of attention to detail. Now this might look like a good selection of desktop backgrounds but it only seems like there are one or two new ones here and they might have removed a few of the older ones. Uh, again it's a good selection of good um, images that I quite like so that is a beautiful beautiful picture there. So basically how the GNOME desktop works. And the GNOME desktop is a controversial one at that because it doesn't follow the standard uh, Windows menu um, type of type of affair. It, it, it uses a more dashboardy kind of um, approach. So you've got your favorites down there on the left, you've got all your windows currently open just nicely spread out in the center and then you've got your additional desktops over here on the right hand side and then you can search for programs for example Firefox down there. So that's all pretty good. That's pretty straightforward. Um, the thing is with the GNOME desktop is that, now I can't push the Windows key because the Windows key is a shortcut for something that's not in my virtual machine, but you can just press the, the Windows key and then start typing into your um, your commands and then uh, there's a version of IceCat in the software repositories there. So yeah, you can type in an application you'll see the installed ones at the top here and then it gives you suggestions uh, if it is if an application isn't installed um, that you can install it which is pretty pretty darn cool so um, let's take a look at let's take a look at the tweak tool to begin with now I actually had to install this this did not come with the distribution environment um, it the package is called gnome tweak tool uh, hyphenated and 
you can install this. I believe in previous versions it might have come pre-installed, or I think on the Ubuntu GNOME edition it comes pre-installed. Many distributions come with this um, GNOME tweak tool because it allows you to retheme um, and it allows you to make uh, to implement a dark theme. And as you guys know, I really do quite enjoy a good dark theme. I think it looks really quite slick. You can adjust. Uh, you can you can. Uh, adjust the icons on the desktop again as someone that doesn't like I, I, I just consider desktop icons to be a relic from the 90s they were very useful very good while they existed but now times have moved on it gives you um, some nice extensions here so you can have like a Windows list at the bottom so you can you can customize the GNOME desktop a lot there's fonts this is this is a pretty this is, this is a very nice customized tool but it allows you to, uh, and it allows you to, to to adjust the user interface in uh, in customizable ways. I think most people consider it an essential install because the thing is about the GNOME desktop environment is that it it makes a lot of choices for you, and whereas that is quite good for new users, and I think that GNOME is probably one of the best, if not the best, desktop to introduce new users over to Linux because the th the thing is. There is a school of thought that says make it look as much like Windows as possible, therefore the transition will seem a little bit more seamless. But my philosophy, whereas doesn't necessarily directly contradict that, is just make it as straightforward and easy to use as possible. And for any given task, try and do it using the fewest number of clicks, using the most straightforward uh, way possible, and include as much documentation as you can along the way in sort of digestible chunks. And I think GNOME does this really quite well. Um, it gives you as much information as possible at an immediate glance. So here it gives you, uh, I don't like the, in the corner here, this, as you can see here, I've got Keypass X installed. Um, this is where the system tray icons go. And this is GNOME 20, uh, 22, GNOME uh, 3.22 to be precise. So not the latest version of GNOME, if I'm correct, uh, but it is past the GNOME 0 0.20, so it means that it, it um, accepts the new themes, which is quite nice. Um, so I don't like that, but considering that that's a pretty minor dis transgression, and there are also uh, add-ons that allow you to get your system tra uh, tool icons to be up here in the top right-hand uh, corner. Um, the volume power manager applets and all this kind of stuff, this is all pretty good. Uh, and it gives you the date, and it gives you access to the calendar. This is great as well. You can add world clocks in, and you can um, you can add in events and stuff like that, and it gives you alarms. This is, I think, the known built-in calendar is 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 really quite good. You know, it, it it's very it's not massively dissimilar to what you might expect on an Android kind of device. So I really quite like that. I also like that by pressing the Windows key, clicking the Activities button, or just moving your your mouse pointer into the corner of the screen all of your windows are immediately on display. So it's not just an icon representing it, it's not a menu of window lists, it's your windows there for all to see. And I really quite like that, as well as um, a list of your favorites down the side there as well. That is to me, and, and then you've got the search at the top to search for, for Firefox or for whatever other application you might want to search for. Um, and you've got your, your desktops down the side. That to me is a perfect layout. In in a way, it gives you all the inf it gives you as much information as possible in a visually digestible way uh, that's meaningful. Um, you could because the visualization of the windows is quite important because if you've got like six different browser windows open, just uh, and you've only got like the first twenty characters of the description in the in the taskbar or the first twenty characters of the title, not which isn't always descriptive in and of itself. Having a visual impression of just what's on. The front of your browser, what you know, web page you're viewing, or you know, what directory you might be in, or you know, all of this kind of stuff with the titles beneath it and the ability to close them right there. That's a really good dashboard. That is really good, and I am so surprised that more desktop environments have not been created with this kind of user interface in mind. It seems like all other desktop environments seem to be dogmatically sticking to the window menu uh, paradigm. Which is a fine, which is fine. It works. It's just that I would love a lightweight version of GNOME, one that works the exact same way, um, but you know, with that sort of desktop kind of layout, but just without you know less of the fancy graphics, less you know less of the bloat, and, and a more streamlined version. But anyway, we can dream. So, um, 
let's just do a quick look at how the Qt applications look. So I, as you can see, right, if I just pull up the file manager, which is, this is just the base file manager, it's called files, used to be called Nautilus, I believe, is there a... See, I'm always conflicted between icons versus text labels, because whereas I, as a native English speaker, obviously identify with text labels really quite well and easily, much less so than graphics, because you know, and tooltips and so forth. Um, obviously, you know, huge numbers of, you know, of, of people who are going to use this system are not going to be native English speakers and probably would find the, the graphical implementation significantly better, especially if translation is not up to scratch. But anyway, I am digressing and digressing quite a lot in this particular review. I apologize for that. So this is a native application. This is the file manager that comes in. It's called Files and may also be called Nautilus, although I don't know. Um, okay, so this is Caden Live. Caden Live is the video, video editing software that I like to use. It is a part of the KDE framework. Um, and this is version 16.08.2. So that's a pretty neat new version built against Qt 5.7.0. So that's quite a new application built against the Qt 5. Um, toolkit which is and this looks nice this looks nice out of the box so i'm glad to say for two distributions in a row now caden live has installed and run out of the box flawlessly so bravo it did prompt me on my first installation whether or not i wanted to that i should probably be installing vlc if i want to get the best use out of this um, which i can do it's no big deal but good you know, gotta say that is good. Like KD, uh, KDE apps or Qt apps rather, they look native enough. Obviously, they're they're, they're not gonna so they're not gonna have the dark theme applied. I can live with that. That's fine. I could find a theme that is dark uh, completely if I really wanted to. But at this, you know, for the most part, if it looks reasonably consistent and it gets the job done, and I don't have to faff around with it, bravo, good stuff, good stuff. Um, this is. Uh, key pass X which is using Qt 4.8.7 so this is a, using a Qt 4 library and as you can see it still looks pretty natural but there is something slightly afoot with the fonts there's a slightly different font there's also a slightly different font in Caden Live as well so uh, there's a bit of a slight design transgression there but I'm sure it's either something that you, you know you could work out if it really did bother you that much it wouldn't bother me um it just does the job and that's fine. So we can close the file manager now. F to be honest, file managers, for the most part, in my experience, seem generally the same across the board. And you can, of course, always install another one from another desktop environment. I quite like PC Man FM. It's lightweight and it doesn't have too many dependencies. But you can also use Thunar and um, I suppose one of the KDE or Qt ones if you wanted to. It just seems a little bit out of place. It's, it's called filed, Files. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the end of life with Fedora. Now, Fedora is a six monthly distribution. And I've been looking at a good distribution and a, an Ubuntu alternative that I can install on friends and family laptops that I don't really have to spend too much time maintaining and don't require too much in the way of downloads. Now, as it currently stands, um, a number of people I've switched over from Ubuntu uh, to Manjaro. And I've had a great deal of success with that. Um, it allows for more up to the, the, the ability to have like more up to date software and the ability um, to to be able to up, upgrade um, without having to wait for like the six monthly increments. I can just you know whenever I'm at that station, I can just install the updates and then move on. Um, and it's just a command and it's a, and, and go. But that but the, the the updates for Manjaro do pile up and they are quite big. So. It's all right for me in this particular situation because I've got readily available access to pretty fast internet, but uh, and so do so do, so does my community. But I, I I would consider using Fedora as this sort of stand-in because if you look at the uh, the unsupported Fedora releases, and the latest is Fedora twenty two, which I believe. Um, I have maybe I believe I've reviewed on this uh, channel, and I believe Fedora Core five or six was my first distribution. 
So as you can see, they've got uh, a list of the number of days that each distribution has been maintained for. That's really quite useful uh, information there. And as you can see, they pretty consistently outlast a year's worth of maintenance. Um, I can't see a number there that's less than 365. Oh, I can see Fedora Core 2 is 328. But generally speaking, and it seems to have gotten, you know, it seems the support seems to have somewhat increased over time. Um, Fedora, 420 days. <laughs> um, so you you know you, you can you can skip every other release of Fedora it seems uh, without too much of an issue I'm hoping I'm hoping that the upgrade process is, is is that smooth but then again if you install your home on a separate partition then you can switch out reinstall your your base operating system completely uh, from it from a from an image from the website without it being too much of a problem so uh, and that tends to be one of the more preferred ways of doing it because especially if I'm working with a computer I'm not more f I'm not familiar with it's just nice to have a blank canvas rather than have to uh jury rig and bother with the um upgrade process of someone else's machine obviously to each their own um you know I know people that do it remotely so there's also that as an option but it does seem that fedora any release of fedora consistently uh, outlasts a year with its maintenance, which is not too bad. So the long-term support release of Ubuntu is, it can give you between three and five years. So obviously there's a big difference there, but there is, um, out of all the computers that I look after for all the people I know, I see each of those computers less than a year apart, by far. So it's something to bear in mind. It's something to bear in mind. With with Manjaro, I can just type in a command and go. With Fedora, it might be a significant, slightly more involved process. But Fedora is, you know, it it is an option there, and it is not a rolling release. But then having six monthly um, versions kind of brings it very very much closer. Like I don't, I mean, Fedora uses six monthly versions presumably because it tests a lot of the stuff that will then later be used in, in Red Hat and CentOS and, and the likes there. So, so you can kind of see why, like one of Fedora's selling points is that there's a scheduled distribution with pretty new software that comes with it. Um, and in order for that to really maintain, it needs to, to have six monthly release cycles. But but there you go. If you were thinking how often, what you know, what's the least I can up, update or upgrade my distribution and get away with it, I would say it's probably about once a year. Uh, any longer than that, I think you might be asking for some trouble. Um, but again, it depends on your use case. It depends, obviously, whether or not it's connected to the internet, and if so, what are you doing? Okay, so I've got the Fedora magazine uh, release for what's new in Fedora 25 Workstation, uh, and I think I've covered most of the stuff here. It's got GNOME 3.22. Um, which has a, a, a significant number of new features. Uh, this is where it explains about the Wayland display server, um, and we can still choose the old X11 uh, server if required. Fedora Media Writer. The MP3 decoding support. So this release now includes a plugin for MP3 decoding, such as playing music, something which it previously didn't. That is also quite useful because that so as I so from this description I take that to mean that if you click on an MP3 file, it will then go out and get the codec rather than come pre-installed with it. But it does have that as as support, which is quite good. Uh, Flatpak support, which is good. Um, how it checks the versioning for extensions is now different, I believe. And uh, so yeah. Uh, as I said at the beginning of this first impressions take a look at kind of video, there really isn't that much to say about it. This is like Fedora is a pretty consistent release. It releases every six months. Um, it comes with a pretty polished uh, user interface and desktop environment. I don't usually see bugs. It usually tries out newer software. And it keeps everything reasonably nice and consistent. So you can install a version of uh, Fedora that's, you know, version 20. In a couple of years, you can come back to it, install version 24, 25, and still be incredibly familiar with it. Like it makes very, uh, it, it doesn't make drastic, huge, sweeping changes. Um, and I like that. Like it's it's for 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 mass appeal, for for enterprise consumption, for for you know low power users, as it were. That's that's a very good road to go down. 
Okay, so just before I wrap up this first impressions review, uh, I would like to show you Chromium. Now, Chromium, as I understand it, does not come in the standard Fedora repositories. Neither does Steam, neither do NVIDIA drivers. So, uh, I'm just going to quickly talk about RPM Fusion, which you can get at rpmfusion.org, which is a quote-unquote third-party repository uh, that allows you to install uh, free software that, for one reason or another, Fedora have decided not to include in their main repositories, and non-free software, which they legally cannot in, in a lot of countries, so they decide to make it a third-party uh, repository. Now, these repositories are separate from the entire Fedora project, but I do happen to know a number of people that work at Red Hat who also uh, have a lot of faith in the uh, RPM Fusion, and I even believe that there are a significant number of people who actually work at Red Hat who actually work directly on RPM Fusion as well. So even though it's unofficial, it seems pretty well supported. Although I got to say from personal experience, I have had problems uh, with RPM Fusion in the past when it comes to NVIDIA drivers and when it comes to installing Steam. Now, I have actually installed this version of Chromium via the one of the repositories available in RPM Fusion. RPM Fusion is an absolute breeze to install. It's very simple. You just simply click on the RPM Fusion thing that you um for for the version of Fedora that you have. So I've just clicked on RPM Fusion for Fedora 25. I want to keep the file. I should be able to open it in the software center, I hope. There we go. And then I can install it. However, um, this has already been installed, so I don't really know what will be accomplished by doing by continuing that process. But yeah, it's very much a simple, uh, and the, the, it works the same. In fact, I originally did it on Firefox, where you just simply click on this and, and you run the RPM file. You can do it directly through the browser. Uh, it'll set up, it'll install like any other package. Uh, it gives you the command line options here as well. Uh, and that will give you the option to install NVIDIA drivers. It'll give you the option to install Steam. And um, as you can see here, I have Steam installed. So I did that just to make sure that it works. So all in all, it seems like a standard solid Fedora distribution. It doesn't seem like there have been too many problems with using Wayland, at least in the virtual machine. If you guys have used it on bare metal hardware, please let me know down in the comments uh, comment section below how successful you are with it, whether or not there are any bugs that people should be aware of or any other issues that people should be aware of. I've got to say, like, you know, Fedora, pretty reliable, pretty consistent with their um, with their way of doing things. This is the GNOME control panel. We've seen it a million times before. It's pretty comprehensive and it's pretty straightforward. The installation process was easy as well. Maybe not quite as easy as the Ubuntu installer, but I think it gives you a fair number, a few more options. Um, but it's all really as as easy as each other, really. If I'm completely honest, um, I you know I'm I'm really just sort of nitpicking at that point. Overall, solid uh, solid release. RPM Fusion seems to work um, pretty well. I've not had any problems with it in this particular trial. I do have to say that it does make me feel a little bit cautious that RPM Fusion is such is is so required in order to get um, a decent user experience out of uh, Fedora for things like home use and um, and support for third party code codecs and all that kind of stuff. But um, that's the way that they've decided to do things. And Fedora, of course, is part of Red Hat, or uh, uh, you know, and and it, and it is effectively the where Red Hat sort of test out a lot of their their software in the wild to see how it lands, how it works, and then um, you know progressions made through Fedora will then be incorporated in, in Red Hat later on, and that seems to be the way that it works. And for, you know, Red Hat is a billion dollar company, so one of the few that we have in the Linux world, and they seem to be doing pretty well. And um, and every time I've seen them in the news, it's always been good things about them. So you know, Red Hat, Fedora. Solid company, solid distribution. Like I say, the only real reservation I have is that it, it's heavy dependence on RPM Fusion in order to get yourself a solid working distribution. There are obviously going to be legal reasons for that. Um, I th also think that there are reasons that they, they want to encourage you to use certain software over others, which is why they decide not to list certain software in the repositories. Um, 
the command line for installing software, it works almost identically to apt from um, from Ubuntu and from Debian. Um, instead of apt, it's a, pro a program called DNF. You can also still use yum, Y-U-M, if that's something that you're familiar with here on Fedora. But you can use DNF, and you can use it almost as a drop-in replacement for apt. So you could do um, apt search package name or apt install package name, and it's as easy as that. Obviously, you need uh, root permissions to do that. So... I apologize for the significantly more waffly um, Fedora blog <laughs> as usual than usual, but there are a few things about Fedora. It's been a while since I've, I've seen a Fedora-based distribution. Um, the last one was, of course, Fedora, and I just wanted to share some of my thoughts on the distribution as a whole, as well as just taking a first impressions quick look at Fedora 25. Again, um, one of these days is going to be good enough for me to start using it on in, in a production environment. And there's no reason why it isn't now other than that dependence on RPM Fusion and also that I seem to be having just as good a success with something like Manjaro or, or Arch or, or Antergos. So, you know, and I usually fi I finished off at like the last half dozen of videos with this kind of feeling that Linux is in a really good place right now. And one of the reasons I wouldn't use a distribution tend to focus around the fact that there are other distributions that suit me more. Um, and that's a really good place to be. Like I'm not, I'm not moving away from distributions because they're repelling me. I'm moving towards other distributions because they're enticing me. With the elephant in the room exception of of Ubuntu and wireless, and and and, and I'm forever going to be frustrated by this this event where there are just this huge number of laptops that, um, and and wireless cards that don't seem to be able to be supported under Ubuntu. That's like a huge problem. Um, that um, that I wish would get sorted. But anyway, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to check out some of the social media links that I left in the description down below. And until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome. Take care now.